So, um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matt Jones. Uh, I'm one of the community here in uh, university and in the computational foundry. Uh, and I'm delighted um, to welcome you all here for a very special occasion, the Callaghan Memorial Lecture. And it's a particular honour to welcome back uh, Lord Callaghan's family. Thank you so much again for lending that important name, and much more than a name, a vision of what can be possible. And tonight we'll be hearing about possibilities, uh, perhaps good ones, perhaps bad ones, from our speaker, uh, Professor Ben Schneiderman. Before I tell you about Ben, though, I'd like to say a little bit about uh, the building that you've all come into today. It's called a computational foundry. Now, some of you aren't from Swansea, uh, but all of us know that Swansea is a very special place. And some 200 years ago, it was really at the heart of major transformations for the world. It played a pivotal role in the Industrial Revolution. Every single ounce of copper that went out across the world left this place. Swansea created myriads of futures and wither material. That was Swansea of the past, and it's important to remember our heritage. We called the foundry the foundry to link us to that past, to recognise our proud heritage that we have with creating materials that can change the world. But much more than that, we call it the foundry because we are looking to the future. The materials that are and will transform society, the economy, your friends, your families, everything you do will be digital in form. Computational Foundry then is about creating new understandings of that material that will go out from this place and transform lives and livelihoods globally. And it isn't just for the university. We're in a region that I think in the next five years will change radically in terms of its interactions with digital industries. And the computational foundry is about providing leadership and support and service to all of those people who want to join us in that mission to do good with computational science. Now, I'm very excited about computer science. I am a computer scientist. And you've probably all got a mobile phone in your pocket or near you. It is very seductive, and it is very compelling. But right now, there's a darkness descending on the digital, and on digital organisations. People are worried about their privacy. You might be worried about how much time you spend looking down in that dark screen, poking at your mobile phone. You might be worried about trolls, about echo chambers, that kind of excitement of computing seems to be darkening. I've got some good news for you. The Computational Foundry is a beacon of hope and light. And our mission is to bring a very human-centered lens to all the excellent science that we do. It is only by involving people in their future, by having as many perspectives as possible on the problems, that we will create these new materials that can celebrate the most important technology that's in this room. And that is you. We can get very excited by computing, but humans are the most wondrous creations and technologies that have and will transform the world. Ben Schneiderman uh, has been helping us uh, shape that vision uh, for a great many years here at Swansea. And last year we recognised Ben's, well, not only his uh, prestigious academic record and world leadership of ideas in human-centred computing, but his commitment to Swansea to create a new way of thinking about computation. Ben has uh, changed the world in many ways. Uh, and I'm going to embarrass you a bit, Ben. Ben pioneered uh, what's called direct manipulation. So when you drag and drop and point and click, the foundational ideas came from Ben and his group. When you click on a web link, the basis and the framework came from Ben's group. 
When you use photo tagging systems, and I'm sure we all do, perhaps in Facebook right now, someone is tagging me and saying, I wish this person would stop talking. Ben's group pioneered the understandings of that, and many, many, many more things. But the biggest way I think Ben has changed the world is by inspiring people, inspiring his students, inspiring his teammates, inspiring his colleagues, telling them that you can do excellent <coughs> research and teaching and change the world. And if you don't start by looking out to the world, thinking about the world, you're a noisy gong. All you're doing is creating papers and creating degrees. So personally, I've benefited hugely by Ben's mentorship, and it is therefore a, a supreme delight for me to have you here again today, and Ben is with us all week to help us. So will you join me now to welcome a uh, friend of the university, my friend, Ben Scheidemann. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome for that kind introduction and for all of you joining this evening for what I hope will be a dialogue, a discussion, as well as a presentation. I hope to trigger many thoughts on your mind. Um, the introduction gave a very good idea about the computational foundry and its importance. And that idea, the vision of the foundry uh, that Matt and his colleagues have promoted, Alan Dix, uh, have, is, is something that attracts me, and it's something that's hopeful, it's positive, as you said, and that's tonight's message also. It's a very positive message. It's a human-centered message, and that's the title, A Human-Centered Future to Artificial Intelligence. And there's a positive outcome here. There are challenges that you've suggested already that we are facing, and even greater challenges that will come ahead. But I believe, as you have stated, and it's lovely to hear those words, that the remarkable, unbounded creativity of humans is what we need to celebrate. And so that's, that's the larger message. And the central story here, and just to tell you where we're going to be at the end of this talk, is that the old computing, the old computing, is about what computers could do. And we'll talk about that. And that old computing did a lot for us, and continues to do. But the future is with the new computing. And new computing is about what people can do when they are given appropriate technologies to empower them, to enhance their abilities, to augment, to amplify. When designers shift their attention away from the chips and the devices and the technology and think about how humans, how they can serve human needs, phrase that was very important to me from the sociologist Lewis Mumford, that the goal of technology is always to serve human needs. And so we will need to say, what are those human needs? <laughs> That's where we're going tonight. I have, looking at Michael Callahan, I have to say thank you also to the family. Uh, I did my homework in studying about James Callahan. I was impressed and honored to be named as the the, the speaker, the lecturer for the, for the year, and I guess it impressed me in his, uh, in his portfolio was that he's, I think, still the only person ever to have had, held the position of Chancellor of the Exchequer, Home Secretary, Foreign Secretary, and Prime Minister. And in speaking to Michael earlier, he said, you have to understand my father was a member of Parliament in one way or another from 1945 onwards, mm -hmm. through his entire life. And that's a model of human ser of, of public service that is really an inspiration. And so I'm very proud to be listed with the name of the James Callahan Lecturer. And also the list of previous speakers are an admirable group that I'm happy to join. So that's a one appreciation. Also, my appreciation to Swansea. This is my fourth visit. Last year in July, I received an honorary doctorate from the university, which I take great pride in, and I hope to continue to help build. What I see is a visionary, visionary group of people who have, at their core, the belief in a human-centered future. Now, it's also another admirable aspect of Swansea. I came to know its motto is, technology 
without culture is bereft. Technology without culture is bereft. A very strong and powerful statement that I really resonated with because it says that the key to making good technology is culture. And of course, culture addresses those human notions. Okay? And that's where we're going. So we're going to try to identify what are those human features that we want to serve through the technologies that we will design in this building and in many other places around the world. Okay? So I mentioned that the old computing has origins that were influential to me. I was trained as a computer scientist, and I worked on traditional computer science, database systems, file optimization, <laughs> indexing strategies, traditional mathematical things to design the technology. But in my career, I became, I like to say, 20% of an experimental psychologist as I began to study how it is that people use that technology. And I learned the methods of controlled experimental psychology to be able to study those human performance so as to make improvements in the design. Matt mentioned some of those contributions. Some of them are small. The idea of a highlighted set of words on a screen, and if you touch or click on them and go somewhere, it seems obvious. How else could you do it? But it was a new idea at the time. And those little touchscreen keyboards on your mobile phone. At the time, there were nine inch wide keyboards because the touch screens required inch size buttons. And we developed the strategies that would allow you to point at a small button and made a seven inch keyboard, and then a five inch, and then a three inch keyboard. Very much in the spirit of engineering and design, refinements, prototyping, measurement. Okay? And being able to point at small targets like a little keyboard was a very simple idea, and it happened because the change in attitude, a simple technology shift from the land on strategies, the previous touch screens required that when you land on it, it gets activated. So you needed a big button. But we developed the notion that you could put your finger on the screen and drag it around, slide it around, shift it, and then you activate when you lift off. And that idea of lift off enabled higher precision and smaller keyboards that we saw that small mobile devices, that home touchscreen systems, that kiosks in airports would all become natural ways because it was, as, as Matt said, the notion of direct manipulation. <laughs> you actually touch the thing that you care about. You drag it, you click it, you stretch it. All those things were uh, the foundational ideas that have become so widespread that they seem normal that you don't even think twice about them. So, I came from a world which was computer science and a very traditional mathematical technology driven one. It was a world of chip design, of chip speeds, of the speeds of algorithm, of the size of the databases. And that old computing gave us a great deal of advantage. Moore's Law, that doubling of speed of computers and lowering of price every 18 or 24 months was a remarkable, remarkable change. Okay. And I lived through that era with great admiration, but now I come to see that in our maturity, we need to shift from what we count. It's no longer about counting how fast the chips are. It's a matter of saying what it is that you can do with your devices, what it is that your children can do, how you can communicate with one another, how you can build relationships, make businesses, get medical information, create social communities. That's where it's going. Those are the human-centered views. So, one part of the old computing was the technology of chips and all the, tech, the, the things that made it work. The other part of the old computing is this now still growing notion of artificial intelligence. A term that I've, I don't know, danced around, followed around, challenged, argued with for all of my career. And I would say, while that notion of artificial intelligence had some merit, had some help, helpful aspects, more and more people are coming to understand that that too is part of the old computer. And that we need to get beyond artificial intelligence 
and think about serving human needs. That will be the new computing. We will talk more explicitly of what it is that people need to accomplish in their life, what do they want to do, and how we can empower them to do it. So the artificial intelligence notions have a couple of serious problems that I'd like to point at directly and, and you know, make, make the example. The first is this notion of humanoid robots or machines, that the way to design computers is to base it on a person. And that the way we measure success is how well that computer does compare to a person. And the goal is to do as well or maybe better. Can the computer beat the grandmaster chess player or the go player? Can the computer read a mammogram more accurately than a radiologist? And that kind of thinking is now increasingly clear to me as being part of the old computer. I have little interest in making a machine and do, to do what a human does. I am interested to develop technologies that enable each person to be a thousand times more powerful than they ever were. A thousand times more powerful. And I see these examples everywhere, and I see the opportunities for doing that to be the future. That's what I think the computational foundry can lead the way in that, that new kind of thinking. So what are these thousand-fold amplifications? Well, take even something simple like sending a text message, okay? 30, 40, 50 years ago, only, only the leaders of countries could reach a thousand people with a message. And now every high school kid can send a message, or any one of us can send a message that reaches thousands of people in minutes. That's empowering. Okay? Similarly, any, the, 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 uh, the idea of taking photographs. In 1839, Daguerre and Fox Talbot were creating photography. Only a few thousand people could take photographs. It took till the 1880s when George Eastman made the Kodak camera that allowed thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to take a photograph. And now, this device in our pocket allows people everywhere to take photos. It's estimated more than a trillion photographs are taken a year using these devices. And so that empowering force is enormous. And it's not just the taking of the photograph, but the sharing of the photograph, the sending of the photograph, the editing of the photograph, all those ways that people's abilities are amplified. Now, I'm not the only one to have seen this, and, uh, I, but I, I saw it maybe in, in an interesting way. In 1993, I was invited by the board of directors of Intel Corporation to come to their headquarters in Santa Clara, California, to speak to their board of directors, which included the famed Gordon Moore of Moore's Law. Okay? And, I, and their question for me is, at that time, 1993, what are the demands, what are the uses of computers that will generate the need for high-powered chips that would be low-cost consumer products? Remember, the market was largely scientific computing, military computing, high-end. The idea of widespread consumer, well, it had been growing, but it was still in its early phases. The personal computer was becoming part of the culture, but it's still a growing notion. So I thought about it a long time, and if my, my message to them was the idea of media. And I said, and this was, I was not the only one saying this, but music, I said, photos, I said. And the idea of creating something, that some, each person can create something that they can share with someone else. And then I said, and videos. And they, they look back and they say, yes, we think Hollywood videos will be broadcast to thousands of people. And remember, 1993, the, the web had just begun. Internet capacities were slow. And the idea of downloading a Hollywood video or watching a movie was 
pretty ambitious. The resolution of the screens were low, 640 by 480 pixels. So you didn't get that wonderful image that you'd have in a movie theater. So, but they all said, yes, we, we believe there's a market for people to download videos. And I said, yes, but wait. I said, in the future, a million people will make and upload videos. And that, they said, they looked at me and they thought that was really a stretch. At that point, probably less than a hundred studios in Hollywood or in London could make videos that had, you know, amp, uh, sufficient quality to make them valuable. And the idea that a million people would be uploading videos seemed far out of range. But I, of course, was wrong, because it's a billion people who have uploaded videos. Okay, it's a billion people who have you know, billions of videos are viewed per year, okay? And it's an amplification of human abilities that is far more than a thousandfold. But the capacity of every high school kid to create videos, to create music, to create games, to share them at scale, is, is a tremendous transformation. Now, so I think that's the first part of it, where you're seeing this broad reach, where I think neither the old computing ideas of, of hardware design, chip design, nor the artificial intelligence envisioned that there would be such outpouring of human creative work. Part of that creative work is the idea of sharing information. Now that was also seen early as a possibility. After all, we talked about the information superhighway. We talked about the information age, and it was information that the internet was about. And yes, it's true, those were the early stages, but I think you see where I'm going. It's not just getting the information, it's creating the information, okay? And the second remarkable transformation, we have to remember the, uh, this message of unbounded human creativity. What happens? Where does the information come from? Well, yes, there are sometimes centralized sources of an individual, an organization, a government that produces a body of information that's shared widely. But that's the tiniest fraction of the information that we use. The huge, overwhelming majority of information is that which is generated by all those people who came forward to do something creative. Now, sometimes it's small things. It's a book review on Amazon. It's a trip review on TripAdvisor. It's a review of a performance of a doctor or a plumber. And it's small little reviews. Sometimes it's more than that. Okay, sometimes people start to write a blog and they write repeatedly about parenting. Or they write about a certain kind of medical care. And they begin to tell stories. And the capacity to tell these textual stories grows. And then you see these wonderful ideas, like Wikipedia. Okay, I looked up James Callahan on Wikipedia. <laughs> it's one of the six million articles in English in Wikipedia. Wikipedia exists in 200 languages. And it's created by millions of people who each create a little bit of part of those stories and edited in a communal way. Today, in looking over, I sent a message to Matt, I suggested, it might be nice to write a Wikipedia article about the computational foundry. It's a sort of way of getting a message out. And it's the remarkable thing is that anyone can edit. You don't have to ask permission. You just go edit. Startling. Now, you may know the story of Wikipedia, that uh, it was started as an alternative to traditional encyclopedias, like Encyclopedia Britannica, created by a centralized organization. Okay? And it was called Newpedia. Jimmy Wales was the initiative behind this, and for two years, he tried to make this Newpedia idea work by having commissioning articles and getting people to review and ensure high quality. But then somehow it turned around, and the doors were opened, and to everyone's amazement, people came forward to 
write about topics they knew about, to edit the articles that they saw, to add details and information. I twice attended the Wikimania conference. And if you ever want to have, if you're ever depressed or having trouble about the world, come to the Wikimania conference and you will see energetic young people committed to the idea of making information available for free for everyone in the world in their own language. It's, you know, a staggering notion that it works. And I hope some of you maybe contribute a few pounds each year, each, you know, Christmas they ask for small donations, and I do that, and I hope you would too. It's such a virtuous, inspirational notion. And it provides a service. It's one of the top ten websites. Remember, you've got a nonprofit organization with about less than a hundred employees who simply keep it working, and millions of volunteers who have the reach, the power, the influence of the biggest corporations in the world. You know? So it's uh, it's very heartening to see that human-centered approach, where by using the right mechanisms you can engage so many people to work together in a constructive way. And that's where we're going. That's where we're going. So think then, it's not that Wikipedia is done. What are the next 10 or 100 Wikipedias? What are the ways that you, the students here, the faculty, might create new opportunities that will bring people in to create something new? that will give them the experience of a small edit of writing a new article, making a book review, telling a story, making a, a recommendation for medical care. There's so many opportunities that I think that, that the future will bring to us. Okay? So that's this human-centered view. I, I repeat that it's about enabling people to create to enable them, to empowering them, enhancing them, amplifying their abilities, augmenting them, giving them the tools, the tools, the tools to make something new. And I'm making a contrast of that view of the world to what you see and hear about so much these days about artificial intelligence, where the machines will take over, the machines will take all our jobs, we will have nothing to do because the machines will do all the work. This is preposterous. I mean, this was stimulated about six years ago by an Oxford University report which suggested that 47% of all jobs could be automated. Okay? 47% of jobs could be automated. And suddenly people say, my gosh, there'll be 47% unemployment. Well, I think if you looked, if you did the same study 50 years ago, you would have found also 47% of jobs could be automated. The continuous process of technology is to empower people and to enable them to do more. And so the jobs of the past give way to new jobs. Okay? In the U.S. and in the U.K. in 1900, approximately 40% of the population was engaged in agriculture. By now, it's under 4%. Okay? And we don't have 36% unemployment because we've raised a whole new culture of ways that food distribution, food production, restaurants, and creative opportunities that Jamie Oliver's and Otto Lenghi's of the world now create new audiences, new markets, new opportunities, new creative, raises people's expectations of what the quality of the food they eat, the nutritional aspects, and their pleasure in the food, and their pleasure in cooking food. It's you know, you come to England and you know, watch television and it's all about cooking. You know, there's a lot about cooking on television. And because people want to make something, okay, they want to cook as well. So if you can find the ways to empower that creative opportunity, you're doing well. Now let's take a look at some more of those examples and the contrast with the artificial intelligence view that the machines will do the work for you as opposed to, I'm going to allow you to do ever greater levels of work. You're going to be not just an expert, but a super expert. The novice will become the expert. The novice will become the creative productive. You can make films, you can make music, you can make poetry, you can, and you have an audience. And audiences are the next part of this, because it's not just about making information, but it's having people 
use it and read it, and then feedback to you. They say, feedback is the breakfast of champions. That getting the feedback from those who use your work drives you further, raises the quality, challenges what you do, <laughs> but it takes you one step further. So as you look at the strategies for a human-centered future and for empowering people, you've got to think not about the individual only and the production of information, but the social community. Okay? And the rise of social communities is the next wonderful story that's happened here, that we see the, the rich discussions, not just by email and text messages and posting and blogs and so on and video, but the rich, and, and the, the Wikipedia community is sort of exemplary one, okay? Um, but there's many, many, many communities. There's a Swansea community, there's political communities. And the tools for organizing communities are getting going much more strongly. I think that's maybe a next big opportunity. We've seen the transition to social media, and again, the computer scientists, official computer scientists, missed that idea. But the creative notion that you people really want to be connected to others is, is central to uh, what, what's happening now and to the future. And so there are now increasing opportunities to organize politically, increasing opportunities to organize communities, to build connections, to make safer cities, to make to deal with the problems you were describing of privacy violation, of terrorism, of fake news. We have real problems that I'm going to come back to. But I think that's where we want to go. How do we engage communities in these productive ways that they can, they can take care of themselves and they can help others and they can have the feedback mechanisms? So the creativity, production of information, the participation, and the dissemination are all these human-centered qualities. Now, I want to make one more comment important comment looking back about uh, the artificial intelligence views. I criticize already the humanoid robot notion. That AI had it wrong, or some of the people in AI had it wrong, because they were suggesting that people were in competition, or human, robots would be in competition with people. And that first notion of humanoid robots has been a dream for hundreds of years, but it has no future, okay? It's, it's a game, okay? Jacques Droz in 1770 created three robots. There was a musician, there was a draftsman, uh, and there was, a, uh, there was a, a, a poetry writer. And these could be programmed, and you can see them, they're merely museum pieces for the following generation. But that seductive vision of creating a human form robot remains strong. And it's something I fought all along in, in my career. So you had early bank machines that were called Tilly the Teller. Okay? Harvey Wallbanker. Okay? <laughs> and so on. That the initial inspiration is to make a machine that's human in form. You still see these stories of human faces on computers sometimes. Anna Nova, the newsreader, uh, was one. The Postal Buddy was a human-sized robot that you could get your postal work done. The Asimo from uh, Honda, it's sort of a, you know, almost human-sized little robot, white, and walks around. It's been around for 15 years. It's great at industrial shows, but it goes nowhere commercially. And most recently, David Hansen's social robotics created Sophia. Sophia, the social robot. Huge publicity. Huge publicity all around the world. In fact, Saudi Arabia gave Sophia citizenship. Right? And there's this incredible belief that that's the next big thing. And similarly, the, the, the notion of elder care robots, that they'll somehow stand up, walk around, help you, and be your friend. I don't think that's where we're going. I don't think that's where we're going. And again and again, and there's, there's, there are many more stories of how that humanoid vision fails. 
What people want is the capacity to take care of themselves, the capacity to meet with other people, to be connected with other people, to work together, to have a community. That's what you want to build and serve. So, one of the dilemmas of AI, or I would say the failures or misleading one, is the humanoid robot. The second is excessive automation, or autonomy, to use the current buzzword. There's a great belief by some in the old AI community that what you want are autonomous machines, autonomous planes, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. Okay? And there's something alluring about that, but again, I suggest it's misleading and sometimes it's deadly. Let me show how I think that form of thinking leads to deadly outcomes. Current story is about the Boeing 737 MAX airplane. You may know that in October of last year, one of these new planes crashed on takeoff in Indonesia. A few months later, a second one with the same profile crashed in Ethiopia. And there are many versions of the story that I've read carefully, but let me tell you my version. How did this come about? What was, where was this deadly AI, this killer robot, that killed, in each case, almost 200 people? Okay. The 737 is the most popular airplane, commercial airplane, ever built. Okay, there are more than 8,000 have been built already. Boeing has orders for another 4,000. Okay, it's a remarkable 15-year success story. The early plane was a small plane. It had two engines under the wing. The wings were low. It was a small plane. And the intake was 30-inch diameter fan blade. Okay? And the, the wings were kind of low because the plane was small. And the, the engines just tucked underneath. And in fact, it was kind of a problem because they might hit the ground. So they had to design them really close that way. As the years went by, the success of this plane generated increased orders, and the airlines wanted bigger planes. They wanted longer distances, more carrying capacity, more energy efficiency. And that all happened because you could have more powerful engines if they were larger. And so the 737 MAX has a 70-inch, can I do 70 inches? I think not quite, a 70-inch intake. And so the engine could no longer fit comfortably under the wing. And so they moved the engine a little bit forward and a little bit up to make it fit the geometry that was possible. Now this was a good idea. This seemed to make sense. But it had a problem. Because of that geometry, on takeoff when the plane is climbing, there's a tendency for the wing or the jet to go, to go further up. And if it tilts up above 10 degrees, there's a greater risk of stall. That is, the airflow over the wing would not support the weight of the plane, especially this heavy plane. And so Boeing engineers thought they could solve this problem by an automated, intelligent machine that would tilt the engine, tilt the leave the end, tilt the plane downward slightly, and compensate. And the engineers were so confident that the technology, the smart, intelligent technology, would work all the time, that they didn't even tell the pilots that this was happening. Okay? So, this was also aligned with Boeing's plans to make a, a plane that was familiar to pilots. It's a popular plane and that the airlines could introduce easily without retraining the pilots without complicated features and, and, and training time, okay? Well, as you can see, it didn't quite work out as safely as I hoped. The problem was, the design was dependent on the sensor that would tell you the angle of attack, that is, what angle the plane was going. And the design here was dependent on the single sensor on one side. There were two sensors, but it used only one of them. And what seems to have happened 
is that sensor failed. And as the plane was taking off, the computer figured out that it was going too high and therefore turned the nose down to point it down. The pilots looking out the window can see that they should be taking off and ascending, but the plane has turned nose down. They pull back on the stick to try to raise the plane. For a few seconds, that works, but then the excessive automation pushes the nose back down. And 20 times in the 12 minutes from takeoff to crash, they had this battle with this excessive level of automation. There was no display for the pilots that said, here's what's happening, here are your options, here's how you shut it down, this is what might be going on. There was a fully, fully automated autonomous system that just drove the plane ever further down. It's a frightening scenario. Now, that's my version. You'll hear other versions in the news. One is that Boeing was trying to save money by not requiring training. Well, they were responding to the pressure from the airlines who wanted to keep the costs low and avoid retraining. So, okay, there's another story you'll hear about, management practices. The Federal Aviation uh, Administration in the U.S. certifies new planes. And for many years, the way they certified the plane is they would have an FAA engineer who would study the design and would challenge the, air, the, air, the, the Boeing Corporation or whoever was making the plane about the design. But this became problematic for two reasons. It was expensive. They had to have well-trained engineers. And there was some sense that these FAA engineers could not be as knowledgeable as the Boeing engineers. And over the years, the shift was that Boeing would self-certify. Boeing would appoint an, appoint an engineer from their team to challenge themselves. Now, it seemed to work okay, but many people say that's not a truly independent oversight method that would ensure the highest levels of attention. Other stories about this, the, the cause of this problem, was just poor design and engineering that made a single point of failure, one angle of attack sensor going bad, causes a plane to crash. That sounds like a bad design to me. Now, in the world that I come from, from user interface, human computer interaction, human factors, that's a well-studied, well-understood problem that everybody knows about. You don't make consequential systems that have single points of failure. And secondly, you test these things in thorough ways. You have a systematic form of testing that reviews all the possibilities. And I would say, and some may challenge my perception here, but that the approach that's grown up in the last 30 or 40 years in human computer interaction research and usability uh, studies in user experience design did not get followed by those who had unbounded faith in the technology could solve the problem, and we did need to engage the human user. Okay. So, I use that example because it's a current one, it's a potent one, it's consequential, and it was deadly. But I tell you that there are many similar stories. Many similar stories. There are sometimes medical disasters that happen where individuals die because of bad design. Harold Thimbleby, one of your great faculty is my hero for his deep studies about the poor design of medical devices. My own work followed about electronic health record systems, which also had many flaws and still do, and people are dying still because of these poor designs. And those of us who are trying to shift the attention to these new forms of computing to make them more open are, you know, we see a brighter future going. So, um, oh, I, I, sorry, I wanted to make, mention also financial disasters, the flash crash, stock market crash of four years ago, where a trillion dollars was lost in 30 minutes. Okay? Much of it was recovered, but uh, 
this kind of disaster is because the algorithms are given too much autonomy. Now, on Wednesday, the workshop that I've been invited to organize here, I'm very pleased to do, will present uh, this issue, and it will be more of a technical discussion, and also policy-related issues about the term these days is algorithmic accountability, or liability, or responsibility. There's many words being used, fairness, unbiased, and so on, uh, transparent, etc. There's many words, explainable, interpretable algorithms. We're trying to shift the agenda, and I suggested that the, the six speakers we have and the 75 people who will be attending, maybe we can come out with a Swansea manifesto for algorithmic accountability and talk about the ways in which we can make a human-centered approach to these algorithms. Part of that approach is to make human-centered social systems that would provide independent oversight for, uh, for such systems. So I will propose on Wednesday the idea of a National Algorithm Safety Board, which in the U.S. is parallel to the National Transportation Safety Board, which is an independent agency that investigates airline crashes and, and, tra and car and boat, etc., disasters. They are highly respected, they're independent, and they have great influence. And so the notion of a National Algorithm Safety Board has gained some traction, I'm pleased to say, and I, I find that that's one of three or four ways that we may see a brighter future that will allow the use of these broader technologies. So I think the insurance companies are another opportunity where they will only insure um, medical systems or manufacturing systems if they live up to certain things. We've seen how the insurance industry did have a positive effect on building construction to make the right materials, to make safety, and so on, and that's had a huge you know, positive effect. Uh, now, as I talk about this, people have been gaining interest in it, and I think we'll see such things, not just a general algorithm safety board, but there may be medical safety boards, there may be transportation safety boards, there may be food production safety boards, and that the large-scale algorithms that are consequential can be uh, put under a human oversight that will allow for this positive outcome. So, I think I'm coming to the close here um, of where I want to be, um, and my point is that we need to go to a human-centered future for artificial intelligence. The technology of artificial intelligence are impressive. They've engaged our journalists and our Hollywood friends in telling these or showing these these you know amazing worlds of the future, but I think they've often been misleading, and I think. The computational foundry and those who believe in a human-centered future need to come back to our understanding of how we serve human needs and how we make the new computing to be about what people can do, not about what the technology can do. And it is a deeper understanding, and the research going on here at Maryland and other places is studying how do people work together? How do you build communities? How do you create... Um, opportunities that people can be creative, that they can make something new using these technologies and have an audience that's broad and has mostly positive impacts. Um, Jenny Priest, my wife, will be doing a workshop on Thursday about citizen science, which is exactly one of these kind of strategies that will allow people to contribute information about scientific evidence, climate change among them, but many other scientific problems that are being studied. And by shifting science from being a narrow, centralized, old-fashioned version to an open one where many people can contribute and create, we get many, many new opportunities. And I, I just want to make sure I get to Matt's point about the dangers. I've said already, there are real dangers. Well, I'm proud of what I've done and the community I participate in has accomplished and how it's transformed the world we live in, there are real dangers about privacy protection, about <clears throat> fake news, about election interference. We've seen how these positive mechanisms, which have billions of people participating, 
small number of people, the criminals, the terrorists, the malicious actors, can actually make serious problems. So we need to push the companies to do more to control these dangerous outcomes, and we need to all be engaged to understand how they come about and how we can work more effectively together to produce these positive outcomes. So I just close to say that you know I'm, I've, I've seen great changes in my life. I see great opportunities for further changes and for a positive outcome. The technology has helped make lives better, brought families closer together, brought medical care to many more people, brought economic development and prosperity to many people. And more, the best is yet to come, as Matt and I both like to say. Um, I do believe the best is yet to come, but it will take a concerted effort by all of us to see that the best outcomes can be produced. And I'm happy to participate here with uh, Swansea and the Computational Foundry to see how we can make this happen. So I thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to discussion from you. Thank you. And, um, you know, would like to take questions or challenges. I have a question. Yeah. Sure. Thank you for the lovely talk. It's a, a pleasure as usual. My question is, where do you see DataViz in, in the world, well, in the world of algorithmic accountability? I, I personally imagine it to play a very important role, but I, I'd be... Why don't, you <laughs> Why don't you identify yourself? Why don't you identify yourself? Oh, Bob Laramie, um, Department of Computer Science, Swansea University. Right, and a leader in information visualization, a topic of importance to me, and something that will be very much on Wednesday's agenda. So, one of those human-centered approaches, this is for the technology side, is to enable people to understand the complex mechanisms within the machine learning and other technologies of, that, are, that are so widely used and celebrated. I, in the last six months, I see remarkable interest and effort and research from leading companies as well as university researchers doing exactly what you're saying. I would say, point you most strongly to Fernanda Viegas at Google, whose work showed how information visualization could make clear the complex underlying processes in the machine learning algorithms that Google was using in their TensorFlow program. And the point, although, although some of the AI world reject this and say, oh, our work is so complicated it's not possible for anybody to understand it, Fernanda's work showed that not only did it was it possible to understand it, but that understanding it actually led to many improvements that the designers of these algorithms did not understand what the algorithms were doing until they could see the visualization that she presented. There's a wonderful 25-minute video that she did earlier this, I guess it's a year ago now, uh, that really shows this in a, in a very powerful way. In the last six months, there's a, there's a nice website I can send you uh, that has about 40 papers that were done in the last year about the role of information visualization. In, uh, in understanding. So I think that's a very powerful one. As you know, I share this view that visualization, because it's a human-centered approach, gives us unusual powers. Now, we're just at the, you know, early stages. Galileo in 1610 was grinding the lenses so that he could see the moons of Jupiter, you know, and it, it took a while till you got the telescopes to be you know, productive enough or the microscopes to be fine enough. And that's where we're at the early stage of visualization tools. And, and Daniel Archambault is another leader in the topic here at Swansea, which is another one of my attractions here, is because you have a strong commitment to the visualization components, which very much put humans as part of the process. I mean, it, it's, it's a tough sell because so many people in the world of artificial intelligence believe in autonomous systems. They don't want to build tools that would require human observation. They argue that it would reduce the effectiveness, but I think the future is pretty clear, 
And I would say, you know, in the last six months, I see a dramatic turnaround. I would say another indication of that is not only under the visualization notion, but the idea of explainable artificial intelligence. In the U.S., the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency developed a program with 11 projects about explainable AI. And now that's opened the doors to many, many, many more activities. And I just startled, pleased, delighted to see that so much work is going in to make those algorithms, you know, understand. There was some, you know, I, I would say some people believe that it was so terrific to have a magical algorithm that nobody could understand, but if nobody understands it, shut it down. That's my, my position. Now, you know, there is a legitimate question about what we mean by understanding an algorithm, okay? I don't expect the algorithm to explain itself in English language words. I don't expect you to follow every line of code. I don't expect you to see. We, we, we've long ago lost that capability with any computer or most, most of it. We don't know what happens at the micro level. But the right forms of design will have a hierarchy so that in a simple case, when I send you a text message and I type the letter and I say go, and it moves it up and turns it into a blue box and it says deliver, at the level of my comprehension, I feel in control, it's comprehensible, it's predictable. Underneath, there's all kinds of complexity. Underneath, there may be all kinds of AI and other things going on, but at the level of the human use, there's a clear sense of feedback that I know what I did, I'm in control, and I can make it happen. And that's the success story of the, the, the tens of millions of applications that are on the iPhones and Android phones everywhere, that giving people comprehensible, predictable uh, control over these systems is really what counts. And visualization, I think, will be a big part of that. Yes, I see another hand. Thank you for that. Hello, uh, my name is Matt Roach, I'm also from the Computational Foundry. Um, you mentioned a nice example of collective intelligence with Wikipedia, I think, and um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts or observations on how collective intelligence might include people and AI, and if there are any thoughts on the design paradigms or, you know, things that people should be considering about creating such systems, uh, how we should yeah. go about that. Sure, I mean, I... The AI technologies are really impressive, but they need to be redesigned as tools. They are not part of the process. Only humans are responsible. Humans are different from machines, okay? It used to be, in fact, in my own book, I had a chapter called The Balance Between Human and Machine Control, okay? And there's a long history of that discussion and the belief that we're going more and more towards machine and I moved away from that belief. I think to put people and machines on the same line of intelligence is the fundamental mistake. There is only human intelligence and there's only computer power. And the idea is to design tools that could be used by humans in more effective ways. If they don't understand what the algorithm is doing, shut it down. So I don't want the autonomous system, I don't want computers uh, as my partners, as my teammates, as my collaborators. I am very devoted to the human as being in control. Now we need powerful automation. Sometimes we need it to be very rapid. I mean, of course, uh, you know, we have the airbags in cars, okay? It has to be automatic and rapid. In 200 milliseconds, it needs to respond to the sensor and go. And, in fact, you know, the airbags save about 2,500 people in the U.S. each year. Um, but in the early days, they also killed about 200 people a year because of the bad design and excessive, uh, you know, it was, it was not considered in a usual way. You know, the more modern designs are more effective. So I'm always thinking about how humans can be in control, and when we need to have high-speed things, well, then we'll have to build it, but we need to build it in a careful way. And we need to have the retrospective analysis of failures. So for me, the explainability aspect and the ways to integrate it are that if you're operating a system with a high degree of automation and something goes wrong, let's take the Tesla crash of two years ago, which 
kill the driver. The, the report of the National Transportation Safety Board is really a gift for me. It's a very readable 60-page report that you might want to take a look at. But the message there is excessive automation was put into place. And you need to be more careful and considerate. And then the point was, if you build a tool, and you build a high-speed automation, and something goes wrong, you need to be able to retrospectively go back and replay that event. And then you'll understand what went wrong. And then you can say, ah, I understand why that failure occurred. I now changed my software. And let me show you. Let me replay the event and show you that that failure does not occur. Okay, that's the, I think that's the test of explainability. So I do see... Uh, ample role for all kinds of advanced algorithms, but I want to make sure there's human control over what happens, and then retrospective analysis of failures that you can then improve over time. Feedback again. Thank you. Yes, another question. Hello. So I'm Monica Seisenberger, and I work in formal methods, actually, and uh, logic and explainability a bit. So, so I liked, of course, your story of Boeing and so on. And so this, um, your lecture could have been perfect in our critical systems course, what we teach to students. So, but what we heard was always uh, by students, okay, but safety critical systems, how many jobs are there compared to all other systems, uh, all other computer jobs? So what would you give, to, what advice would you give to people working on formal methods to be actually more heard? Because these things, what you said, we know that, how to build systems safely, and yeah. so on. Safety is a big issue. Yeah, yeah. I, I do like formal methods. Harold Thimbleby is also a, you know advocate and active worker in, uh, in that area. So I think those are good. Um, I would say, though, they need to be accompanied by these processes that have feedback. So the logging of what happens with even with the formal methods so that you know what goes wrong. Something will go wrong. I mean, computers are, uh, you know, are, are a closed system, but we live and work in open systems. And when the number of ways of failures in the real world, you know, is infinite, we can't design every, we can't have a proof of every possible way. Because we don't know which ways, which ways failures can occur. So I think, I like the idea of formal methods, but I want to also have the idea of logging and of being able to retrospectively analyze failures. Do you want to comment? Is that part of your world? Do you want to respond? Yes, no. Um, I said long time, I, I liked your lecture very much, and I said as a long time, I, the message I was given, okay, we not only want only safety, so we want uh, more interactivity. So and we have here in, once in the computation right. foundry a lot of uh, researchers actually working on safety, on security, and so yeah. on. And it would be really nice to right. bring that into together. So I, that's why I was asking for your right. advice. I, you want to have in these consequential systems with, where you have formal methods of proving, you also want to have a user interface that lets the operators see what's going on. And also, there may be operators who see what's going on at the time of the operation, but also you want to have two kinds of retrospective review. You want to have a review when failures occur, you want to be able to replay the situation and find out what happened. And secondly, you want to have the collection of a million such cases and understand all of the varieties of, of, of failures. So I think those are two grand opportunities to be able to study uh, what happens. But every Robot, every AI system, every algorithm should have a flight data recorder. Okay, that's it should have some, and tools for analyzing. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Oh, um, okay, so it's my. So I'm Alan. I'm Alex. I'm uh, director of the computational foundry, and it's uh, been a great pleasure uh, and a joy to have you here today, Vanny. Um uh, from the beginning of my career, I've, I've known all sorts of aspects of Ben's work, and um, it's fantastic to be here. But one of the things that's been great, I've been sort of looking around at various points, 
and um, seeing so many people at different points nodding their heads and clearly, you know, the, the points that we're talking about are not obtuse issues that are, you know, some academics somewhere studying at a desk. They're issues which touch every one of us. Uh, and it's because computation is everywhere. And um, Matt at the beginning talked about the vision of the foundry. The fact that this is not something that is <coughs> fixed within the bounds of a university, of an academic department. It's something which breaks out. And the things we do here have to be influenced by those. And I was touched also, there's two things I was going to pick out. One was, despite all we talk about in, you know, in terms of not being driven by the machines, it was the time. And um, I think since the Industrial Revolution, uh, it was the Industrial Revolution and the mills, um, I'm not quite sure the copper works, I'm sure as well, but the, the, you know, the unification of time was driven as much by getting people in through the doors. And um, what we're seeing today, and a little bit of the darkness that Matt was talking about, is the way actually often we're seeing the opposite of what you're saying. Um, Uber and the way in which these, these gig economies are actually making us the cogs in the wheel of the autonomy of the machine. Um, and I think the message, there's a message there is that, you know, we, and we're recognising these issues, that it's not something that will passively happen of its own accord. The benefits and the great things that are possible won't just happen. They're things we need to make happen very positively. That's not just about the computing people here, it's about everybody, because you know, the understanding of these issues is critical, because we're in a world where things can go in different directions, and we've got real responsibility to make sure they go the right way. The other thing that I thought was absolutely wonderful, right, is also, um, Ben said at the beginning, why spoil a talk with slides? Now, we, you know, we know about death by PowerPoints and things like that. And in fact, of course, Ben, you are using a computer, right? Because, you know, these things are heavily computerized now. You know, digital processing. The choice. You know, the things that you're talking about, the choice. You made choices about when we use and when we don't use. It's not driven by what technology is available, but the choices you make. And so I thought it was fantastic, the fact that you made choices, and we have choices. Um, I think we've, we've seen the, the opportunities for us today. So anyway, I will... Stop because there's people outside and we're, we're going to be whipped off somewhere else. Two things I'll say before things, but to remind you the, that Ben's already mentioned is on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. If you want to know more about some of these issues, on Wednesday, Algorithm Accountability Day, on uh, Thursday, Citizen Science Day. Um, I think there will be more technically way, but also I think they're topics that will be ones which are open. So anybody here would like to come to that and learn more. These are open events. Um, if you can sign up on the event, do it by pages, that's great. But I think there'll be space if you just squeeze it. There won't be any problems. And it'd be lovely to see uh, any, any of you and all of you at, at those days. Um, and so finally, yes, so thank you very, very, very much indeed for being here, for uh, you know, being part of also honouring the name of uh, James Cullen, who was uh, for both his role here at the university and his role in, in British society. Thank you very much.